commitment
Give him glory, church. You ever been at one of those moments of crisis when you didn't know what to pray for or maybe the urgency of whatever the situation was and just all you could do is just cry out the name of Jesus? Jesus. Jesus. There's no name above his name. great and mighty King. God, as we go through this week leading up to Friday, considering how you willingly went to the cross for us, Lord. Let's just reflect on that this week in our daily prayer time, in our daily lives. That you, our great and mighty King, laid down your life for us. And next Sunday, we're going to celebrate your resurrection, your saving power. You defeated death and hell and the grave for us. Oh, and if you did that, Lord, what a small thing it is for you to work in the little things that we see as big things in our lives, and they are big things in our lives. But you are able to do exceeding and abundantly more than all we could ever ask or imagine. Because the name of Jesus, there's power in your name, wonder-working power. We call on your name, Lord Jesus, this morning. Move in a mighty way. Open our hearts up to you. Let our hearts be fertile ground, God. Open our ears that we may hear. Move in this place. Move in our hearts. Move us, Lord. We want to walk out those doors different than we were when we came in from encountering you. We just look forward to it with expectation this morning. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. As you as you're grabbing your seats and as we're moving I got it I gotta say in this place as we just sang in that song you he has no rival and I feel like that the thing that the Lord would start us off with today is saying is some of us some of us in this room give too much credit to the enemy listen to what I'm saying to you church you have the king of kings living in you and he has no rival he has Satan listen to me and understand this Satan is not his rival Satan is not comparable to God Satan is not the opposite of God Satan doesn't get to take that place anywhere and you ought to not give him that place in your life it is, he is not God's rival he is not worthy of being called that and I want you to not give him that place in your life and so I want to not give him that place in my life and and so I want to say that it is so great to be back I listened last week and I think whenever I was uh, leading you to the place to maybe, hopefully, I was trying to get you to think I was about to say I'm checking out. And I think when I got to that spot, I heard a few early claps. I couldn't see who it was that was clapping, <laughs> but I didn't appreciate it at all. But how great, man, how great was last week. How great was Pastor Matt dropping the word. And, and what God's doing in this place and what he's going to do is, is, hey, listen, I'm just telling you. I'm not going to keep saying it. I'm going to tell you again, though, you better get in and you better hang on because God's about to do something in this place that none of us have seen. None of us have seen. He's going to do it. And when, so when we see great things that he's done, we got to give testimony to it. So... Cinda and I want to say thank you for all the prayers. Thank you for the prayers for her mom. And here's some good news. She tooted this morning. Yes! And she's, 
she's watching online and she's going to be really mad at me for telling you all that. But hey, listen, you learn what to praise him for. We've been waiting for that noise for a long time. So it was a good morning. It was a good morning. Just can't tell you what it means to have you guys here and praying and, and getting to live life with y'all. It's just the greatest thing in the world. So thank you for that. And I, I, I do want to stop talking about that and get into this because I wanna, I'm starting this new series today called In and Out. And as we start this series, I, wanted, I want you to think about, have you ever had the uh, experience where you were looking for something and you weren't quite sure what it was that you were looking for, but you were looking hard for something and come to find out that it had been in front of you the whole time. You just didn't know that it looked like what you were expecting it to look like. Maybe you're looking for a box and, uh, or, or something that was hidden away in a closet somewhere and you thought it was in a yellow box but it was really in the big blue box in front of you the whole time and you were tearing everything apart looking for it and you couldn't find it and then when you did find it you realized it was in front of you all the time I want you to keep that in mind as we go into this series because I'm going to try to do a little bit of teaching this morning and I want you to understand that that is exactly what happened on this day 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago-ish, when Palm Sunday happened, that is exactly what happened, and, and these people understood. And so, as we start this series in and out today, my title of, of today's message is, He Showed Up. He Showed Up. And so, I want to go back and give you a little bit of understanding from the scripture. And so if you have your Bible, I'm going to be reading a passage out of Zechariah. Zechariah is, is the second to last book of the Old Testament. And so you, you get to Matthew and flip over a few pages and you'll find Zechariah. And in Zechariah chapter 9, I want to show you what Palm Sunday is because I'm afraid that too many people don't have an understanding of what Palm Sunday is and so what I want to try to do an effective job of today is I want to teach you what Palm Sunday was originally and I want to teach you why we still make some of the same mistakes today that they made back then but in order to catch that and in order to really gain some glean some understanding from where they were, I want to explain to you what Palm Sunday was. So on this Sunday, when Jesus rode in, and, and you're going to see what happened, the reason that happened is because, and, and don't let me hurt your feelings, just I'm going to be honest with us for a minute, one of the reasons that we don't quite get so much that we're supposed to get is because we don't understand this. And the reason we don't understand this is because we still don't read it. We got to read it in order to ever get it. And, and until we get it, we don't have to keep wondering why the world kicks our butt all the time. There's things that are applicable to our lives from this book that we're never going to be able to use if we don't pick it up and read it, we got to know it. These people, the Jews of this day, when Jesus came in on Palm Sunday, I would just submit to you that I don't think they had very good teaching. And because they didn't have good teaching, I don't think they have a good, had a good understanding. But they knew the scriptures. So the reason that everything happened is because of this passage that I want to read to you from Zechariah. So in Zechariah chapter 9, the prophet is giving this word about what's going to happen. And so listen to what he says. Zechariah chapter 9. <clears throat> hey, I got to, Cindy, you got to help me remember. I got to get some new readers because my Bible shrunk over the last few weeks. I hate wearing those in front of y'all, but, you know, what do you do? That's pretty vain, I know. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. I might need those. I need to borrow those. 
Oh, yeah, that's better. <laughs> Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Listen, these people understood that this is, hey, listen, this is a word written to them. I, I got to stop and preach for a minute. I'm going to tell you something that you've missed out on, that these people didn't miss out on. Where this says, oh, daughter of Zion, these people said, whoa, 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 stop everything. This is a word, and they treated it like this. This is a word from God for me. I'm going to tell you something. Until you start treating your Bible like it's a real word from God for you, He's always just going to be some cartoon character that you send your kids to church to color pictures about. He's never going to be a real, a real deal to you. Listen, I'm, I know I'm kind of getting in your business, and I haven't been here for a couple of weeks, and so I, I love you up front, but I'm talking to me too. This book is a real book, really written with you in mind, that if you would take it and read it and apply it, it would change your life. It would cause you to miss out on a lot of the junk that we keep going through over and over and over. And we're in this, just this stinking thing of going through the same junk over and over and over and over and over. And we're on this merry-go-round and, it, and we're vomiting our guts out because we're tired of going in circles. And our God and our King is going, hey, get off. If you'll just read the word, I'll show you how to get off. And you can stop going in the same circles over and over and over again. I'm just telling you. I got to clean your glasses. <laughs> Hand me some dirty glasses. I'm just telling you, when you read this, you ought to read it just like they did. Like it's written personally to you. That's the reason they celebrated on this day, because of this passage in Zechariah. Because what I'm about to read to you from Matthew, remember, while I, the story I'm going to read from you from Matthew was currently happening, so they didn't have the book of Matthew at the time to read. They were living the book of Matthew, but they lived the book of Matthew because of the book of Zechariah. I wonder what you're going to live. So Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. You see, this word is given to these people to say, here's what you're looking for. When you see your king coming in, you're not going to notice that he's the king because of any other thing. But this is what you look for. He's going to be gentle in his spirit. And he's going to be carrying righteousness and salvation. And this is what you look for. He's going to be riding in on a donkey. Not just a donkey. On the fowl of a donkey. On, a, on the colt of a donkey. Watch for him. Watch for this. Because when this happens, look what it goes on to say. Verse 10. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem. Look, this is to Jerusalem. And he's saying, I'm going to take away your war horses. Normally, that would be a bad thing. But why is it not a bad thing? Well, look what he goes on to say. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea. Now, wait a minute. As I read this next verse, I'm not going to lie. I get a, maybe a little more excited than I should because look what it says. He will rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. I have no doubt that I'll take a little bit of scrutiny from this statement. Because I know 
that when he when this pro, this prophetic word was given from God through Zechariah I know that at that point in Zechariah's mind he was talking about from the Euphrates that's what they called that river but I think it had something to do with us and I mean that and I don't care what anybody thinks about it because I fully expect the kingdom of God to go out from this place into all of the corners of the earth I think that God wants to use this place to have an impact so that the world never looks the same again because we have agreed to come together in a spirit of unity and release the kingdom here on earth like our king told us to. I see us in this passage. And if you don't, you should. Or you should go find another boring church to be involved in. She, Cinda said, no, don't do that. Never mind. <laughs> okay. Let me just really quick. I'll read it all again. So he's talking about, he says, see your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on the colt, the fowl of a donkey. I, and, and so all this is one thing. So they see this first, and then look at the next part of the prophecy. It's so important for you to get this. So then the next part says, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim. I will take the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will pro proclaim peace to all the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Okay. So go from there. Now go over into Matthew chapter 21. Now this is where, this is the day. This is the day. The, the, this is um, Palm Sunday, if you will. This is where they are physically experiencing what they just read about in Zechariah. Okay? Or what they had known about in Zechariah. So verse 21, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage the, uh, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. And now he goes back and he says the prophecy from Zechariah. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt. They placed their cloaks on them and sat Jesus on them. A very, watch this. I have this underlined in my Bible. You should highlight some things. You should underline this. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went on ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let me just pause for a second. There was none, none of these people. There were none of these people that felt like, ah, I'm going to step back because that's, that's for the, those wackos. <laughs> Not, no one did that. They shouted. I'm going to show you here in a minute. The whole town shouted because they were stirred. Why? Because of this. They knew that what he was bringing was directly to affect them. You see, and you lose all your inhibitions and all of your concerns about anything else that the world would set in front of you when you start to really entertain the thought that maybe what this king has brought is really to affect you. 
When you start personalizing this word, you lose the concern of what anybody might think about you. Because you recognize that it's for you. That's what was happening to this whole town. They recognized this. Hosanna in the highest. Look at verse 10. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? There's so many, there's so much going on. All these people have lost their minds. And so those that weren't even followers were drawn out. Why? Please catch this. Why were those that didn't even know God drawn out and part of the stirring because of the worship and the praise of those that did know him? That's what stirs people, and that's what draws people. When people see, oh, my gosh, I know this person, and they've lost something in their lives. They've lost some inhibitions that the rest of us haven't lost. What is it that they've encountered? Because whatever it is that they've encountered, I need it too. I'm telling you, it's going to be worship that's going to lead us to a place of the greatest revival the earth has ever seen. And I firmly believe that we're going to be a part of that. I wholeheartedly believe that. It's about worship. So the whole town was stirred. And they asked, who is this? And then the crowds gathered. This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now I want to flip over to Luke 19 because there's one part that I just, it's the same story, but I got, you got to see this part. From Luke's perspective. Luke 19, look at verse 37. It says, when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all of the miracles they have seen. They've seen the miracles. They know the prophecy from Zechariah. And now they're seeing the fulfillment of both of it. And they recognize he's bringing something to us. And so they, ha they are losing their selves. Look what it says. The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all of the miracles they had seen. Verse 38. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Watch this. Some of the Pharisees, some of the, the church folk they, in the crowd, they said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Oh, this is one of my favorite verses in the scripture. And Jesus said, no, no, no. I tell you, if I stop them, will cry out that's how powerful this king is that's why what what pastor dale comes up here and leads us in is so important and it's so stirring because as you lead us as a body any of us that fail to go along with you in this worship of the king what we are effectively doing is we are we are letting go of our place and if nobody else comes and picks that up then a rock will cry out and I guarantee you there is never going to be a rock that cries out in my place no rock will carry my praise no rock will carry my praise I'm going to praise him I'm going to praise him no matter what anybody thinks no rock is going to stand in my place of worshiping my king and we ought to come to a place where we agree together that, oh, yes, he is my king. See, there's a big difference. The Lord really stirred me with this week with a word for a young man. I shared it with him. And after I shared it with him, I felt like the Lord said, hey, that's more for you and this whole body than it is just for him. But here's what the word was, and I'll share it with you. I think that we are in love with the idea of loving Jesus. And as soon as we surrender that and we stop just entertaining the idea of loving him and we move into the place of really loving him, 
it's going to change everything. It's one thing to be in love with an idea of something. It's a whole other thing to be in love with the thing. It changes everything. So this is, this is what's going on here in Matthew and here in Luke. So the Pharisees are, 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 are trying to get Jesus to quiet them down. Then look what it says. Look what verse 41 says. As he, as Jesus, as he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, look at this, he wept over it. So all these people are coming out. They're laying palm branches in front of him. They're laying their coats down in front of him. And he's, as he's coming close to them and he sees them coming out, he wept over them. Why? Why would Jesus weep over these people that are coming out to worship him? What, what's going on in this place that, that these people are coming out to worship and Jesus sees them and he wept. Here's what it was. He recognized why they were coming out. They were not coming out to meet him. They were coming out to meet the idea of him. I'm telling you, there's something that changes when we get beyond ourselves. Here's what they cried. Here's what the cry of the Jews was. He's coming. He's coming. He is coming. He is coming for what? Well, they recognized the miracles that he had done. They remembered the prophecy from Zechariah. And they thought that the whole fulfillment of Zechariah was fixing to happen. So why were they worshiping him? Don't miss this. Back to, let me just read it again. Listen, you don't even have to turn there with me. Let me just read it to you from Zechariah. Why were they worshiping him? Because you'll see your king coming to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, the colt, the fowl of a donkey. Then listen, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim, the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. Why were they worshiping him? Because of what they thought he was about to do. Palm Sunday was about, they, they lost their minds because they thought that Jesus was coming to free them right then from the reign of the Roman Empire. They weren't looking beyond right now, right here, today. They thought he was going to fix them this day. And whenever they found out that he wasn't there to fix them this day, next week we're going to talk about what happened to them. Jesus, they thought that Jesus was coming to be their king and to reign on earth to free them from all the things that they had been facing. But church, listen to me. Please catch this because I promise you there's a point in this, a deep point that will affect every one of us if you'll hear me. They thought that he was coming to set something up right now. What they missed was that the kingdom of God is not of this world. Jesus said in John 18, my kingdom is not of this world. If you don't have that, John 18 verse 36, if you don't have that verse highlighted, highlight it. Because listen to me, we're so stuck on this world. We're so caught up in this world. We're so caught up in these things, in these problems, that we lose sight of what he's really called us to. We think that if things get, as I follow him, things should get a little bit easier. Does he have that as a plan? Absolutely. My plan is to prosper you and to give you life. I came to give you life and life to the full. Is that his plan? Yes. But is that what we always experience? Absolutely not. And it's the problems and it's the trials and it's the struggles that make us better. Why is it making us better? We go through those things so that we can get better and better and better so that someday when we get to heaven, we know how to really worship him. The problems and the trials and the struggles, they're not happening to us. They're happening for us. They're happening for us, church. And I'm telling you, when we get this, that the kingdom of God is not of this world. It is a spiritual thing that is growing in the hearts of God's people. 
so that we can place our faith and our trust in God. So, when things don't happen the way we thought they were going to happen, what we do is we lose heart. Because we go, God, I thought you were the healer. God, I thought you were going to provide for us. God, I thought that it was going to look like this. And when things don't look like we thought it was going to look like, we lose heart. Why is that, church? Because we're just like them. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We're willing to give him the ultimate praise when we think he's about to do something great for us. But what happens when it doesn't work out like we thought it should? What happens to our praise at that point? What, what causes that to happen in us? Ah, oh, don't, don't lose me. Just stay with me. I'm almost done. I believe that we miss Jesus just like they missed Jesus. Because our problem is just like their problem. We cannot stop focusing on the outside. He's coming. He's coming. I know my bills are going to get paid. He's coming. I know that, my, I know that I'm going to get that car. I'm going to get that house. My family member is going to get healed. He's coming. He's coming. And we're willing to give him the greatest of praise. He's coming. He's coming. I want to show you a passage that Jesus spoke directly to this, to some Pharisees. Really quick. Look at Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Listen. He says you clean the outside of the cup and the dish. Hold on, hold on. Is he talking about a cup and a dish? You better not miss this point, church. Do not miss this point. He says, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside it, they are full of greed and self-indulgence. What's the cup and the dish? It's right here. It's right here. I, 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 I know that this doesn't sound like what we want to hear, but listen, this is truth. Regardless of your circumstances, he still and always will be the king. And he deserves every ounce of praise that we could ever muster up. He's still the king. Even when your circumstances tell you otherwise. Because look, he says to them, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first Clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous. But on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. What's on the inside of you that the rest of us can't see? Because the outside of you today, you look pretty. And that's not what he's looking at. He's looking at the inside of the cup. This would ruin a lot of religious circles. Because if you take a cup, Jesus is saying, you work so hard on cleaning the outside and making sure that it's bright and shiny. What I'm saying to you is, look what's on the inside. Wash the cup on the inside. And watch this. As you're washing the inside, the soap and the cleanliness is going to so wash over the outside, you won't even have to worry about the outside stuff. If you'll just focus on the inside, you don't even have to think about the outside stuff. And that will ruin a lot of church things. Because it's about the outside. Let's clean the outside. Yeah, but I'm broken on the inside. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. Make everybody look like, let everybody think that it's good. 
you're fighting with each other, you're saying horrible things to each other, you're being mean to each other, and then you walk up the sidewalk to church and hold hands and make it look like you're in love. Come on, man. Love is hard. Marriage is hard. We've been doing the thing 25 years, and, and we're not very good at it a lot. It's hard. So we need each other. So that I can sit down with you and go, hey, man, I'm a husband just like you. I'm struggling. Sometimes I don't want to say the things that I need to say to my wife. Sometimes I don't want to open the car door for her. Sometimes I don't want to. We need each other. We need to encourage each other so that we can. Why? Because it's about the inside. I'll close with this verse. I know I preached long today. It's making up from last week. Sorry. Listen. This is my last verse. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 31 says this. So do not worry, saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? Listen, church, what Jesus said. Pagans run after those things. Pagans run after that stuff. And your heavenly Father knows that you need it. But seek first His kingdom. And his righteousness and all of these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And I want you to hear me make this last statement. Listen. If we would let him do on the inside of us what he wants to do then the things that we spend our whole lives for striving on the outside of us would work themselves out. I'm going to make a strong statement. I want you to understand it. Jesus Christ did not come into this world and into your heart to accessorize your life. He's not here to add things to your life he came into this world to become your life so people always say Mark it's got to be one way or the other man he either cares about the stuff you have or he doesn't what are you preaching does he care about the stuff you have absolutely he cares about the stuff he has stuff he wants to give you more than you can ever imagine what he wants to give you he's a good father but we can't get past going after that stuff we so want the stuff we so want the outside things that we don't look about the inside and if we would just work on the inside the outside would take care of itself and I promise you this you would be much better off in the end going his way than you ever will be going your way but we fight him. We resist him. I'm not going to do it that way. I'm not. I am not going to go do that. I'm not going to be a part. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Here, I'll do this. And that's okay. Just don't wonder why you stay in the same circle of brokenness. He's got a better plan for us, church. Let's trust him. Stand up with me. Let's pray. Father, Ooh, that's a lot of that's a lot of stuff to look at today, Jesus. And I just pray, God, you take this word and that you so use it to impact us. Father, to change us. Help us to recognize that we're not much different than these Jews that ran out praising you because they were excited about what you were about to do for them. Whenever it didn't work out like they thought, to see what they cried out one week later they went from crying out Hosanna in the highest to crucify him simply because it didn't work out the way they thought it was going to forgive us of doing the same thing Jesus forgive us so father we need you we love you and we want to learn to love you 
more than the idea of you. We want to have a personal encounter with you. We want to get so caught up with you that we really learn to, to feel you, to hear you, to touch you. We want to be so close to you that when we leave that place of being with you, we go into the world that the world says, you smell like Jesus. You feel like Jesus. You look like Jesus because we're so caught up in this time of being with you, Jesus. Teach us that. And let it start this morning that as we come to this table of communion and close out the service, that we would say, God, your broken body and your spilled blood is the answer for everything. That as we pass the opportunity to give and to be a part, to bring our tithes in, that we say, Lord, we want to be a part of recognizing that you are alive today. We do not worship a dead God, but a live God. And we want to be all in. We want to experience all that you have for us. So God, fill this time up and give us that encounter. We love you and we bless you in Jesus' name.
every single thing you're facing. Cares about every bit of it. Cares about all of it. So I hope that, uh, thank you for indulging me today. I know I preached a little long. I know I was pushing the limits, but again, it was a little built up from missing last week. So I got it all out. Next week I'll be shorter. So next week, bring, bring, bring people back with you again. If, if you're not doing the kid thing, come to the early service. We really want to fill that, that one up. We know the late one will. Come be a part of that. Listen, before you leave, for next week, there's a sign-up for 24 hours of prayer that we have next week. We want, to, we want to cover that as we go into next week. So if you want to be a part of that, go back and sign up in the fellowship hall for that before you leave. And then if you're visiting with us, please stop by the window. We've got a gift that we want to get to you. We sure want you to take that with you before you go. And then I just want to say on a personal note, so many of you, you did such an incredible job. <clears throat> if you didn't get to be here last night for Adam and Elizabeth's wedding, listen, we had church, man. It was cool. It was awesome. And so many of you worked so hard on that. And I know that they want you to know how much they appreciate you, but I want you to know how much I appreciate you. Thank you so much for being such a loving church and for loving on them the way that you do. It was awesome. So God bless you guys. You go out and have a great week. It's going to be incredible. Watch what God's going to do in your life. It's going to be awesome. God bless you, church.